Hello, today we'd like to tell you about our experiences of five years investigating a cult centre on Rome's northwest frontier. Our story focuses on Meriport, and you can see here the fort platform of the Roman side of Meriport on the Cumbrian coast, and uh, on the right side of the image, uh, Senhouse Roman Museum. Uh, the museum uh, that was so important, um, the museum trustees who actually launched uh, the idea of this project, uh, who supported it financially, and who are the guardians, custodians of a world famous collection of Roman altars that triggered our investigation. As the signpost outside the museum reminds us, we are a long way from Rome, um, but we are very close to multiple other sites that made up the Hadrian's Wall frontier system. Here are some of the famous altars discovered in 1870. And uh, we are fortunate to have from the 1870s notes from the excavations that recovered them. This one produced nine years after the diggings uh, shows where uh, pits with altars in were recovered and some of the other holes that were dug at the time too. What's interesting about the altars is that the majority of them are dedicated to Jupiter Optimus Maximus, IOM, and are set up by members of the Maryport garrison. Now, as a group, the altars have attracted international attention the re re repetition amongst the dedications has led people to think that we're looking at perhaps traces of an annual ritual uh, linked to the oath that was sworn by soldiers uh, to the emperor every year. Uh, but it's also led to other uh, assumptions. Uh, one of them is, because the altars are discovered in pits, uh, that this must be explained by the burial of each old altar as every new annual altar is set up. And this idea has become quite enshrined in thinking to the point where uh, people have used uh, Meriport's example of this alleged process uh, to explain the archaeology of other sites. Now I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague Tony Wilmot now to talk through the first three seasons of our excavation at Meriport. Well, here, here, we, here we see the um, geophysical uh, survey done in 2010 by uh, Alan Biggins and David Taylor. Uh, of uh, Maryport. Our excavations for the first three seasons focused on the area where the altars have been recovered from the pits uh, in 1870, marked here. We started digging in uh, um, 2012 and 2011, and um, very soon we started to identify pits in the archaeology. As we recorded these pits, we realised that in no case did our predecessors remove all of the ancient fill. So we had got some of the remaining uh, material to work on. And we soon recognized that one of the principal features were um, these curious green stains, either in the edge of uh, foot square uh, holes within the pit or foot square traces on the base. And these, it quickly became clear, were the results of timber posts rotting away in situ and leaving a void um, where the timber had previously been. Here we see uh, a pit with the antiquarian fill removed and circled there is a stone within the fill of the pit which turned out to be the corner of um, an altar, the corner of, of, of the capital of an altar. Taking this back down to the find shed, down to the museum, uh, our colleague Jane Lasky rapidly identified it as the missing corner uh, in the back of this particular altar, which was dedicated by Marcus Minus Agrippa, but wasn't found in 1870, but in 1725, before 1725, which shows that altars were being recovered from this hill uh, before the uh, 1870 find took place. Now, if we look at in detail at the hole from which the altar came. Um, in green, we've outlined the actual post pipe, the actual post hole from which uh, the post had rotted away. It's a foot square, it's 1.3 meters deep. Um, the red line shows the outline of the original post pit in which this post was um, situated. The solid blue outline and the broken blue outline are aspects of the antiquarian hole. If we take that deeper part of the antiquarian hole, we can see 
that the dimensions of that hole match exactly the dimensions of the altar from which the fragment came that was found in this pit. This altar is right up against the square post hole, indicating the altar has been used as packing in, um, in a post pit, packing for the support of the timber post. Now this was good enough. And then we found the uh, sort of Tutankhamun's tomb of, uh, of Maryport, the one pit that hadn't been disturbed previously. And in it, among all this other stone, we see that this altar, which is basically there because it's stone, not for any other reason. On clearing the other stone, we found that this was indeed uh, a complete altar. And uh, this, uh, this altar found at the bottom of the pit, again, right up against the place where the timber post had stood. Um, this altar fitted with the rest of them. Uh, it was, uh, again, dedicated to IOM by the cohort of Vitazii under the command of Titus Attius Tutor, who is known from three other Maryport altars. And is, it's part of the set that, uh, that we see uh, excavated in 1870. So from this we can see the the top point there with the question mark, this is to do with the internal uh, inscription on the altar. The other two, um, annual burial need to assume a, a, a parade ground, is not the case. In fact these these altars were simply used as rubble as packing for uh, posts for a large timber building. Also uh, on, this, uh, on this site in these first three years, this is a plan of all the pits that were excavated. Uh, this ring ditch is, uh, is an earlier feature, but off up there to the north, at the top of the slide, there are a number of burials. These were stone-lined burials, stone-lined kists for inhumation burials. Because of the acid soil, there's very, very little, well, virtually no human bone remaining. But from one of them, uh, we found a, uh, a bead necklace, but also a tiny fragment of textile, which when radiocarbon dated, proved to be date to uh, basically the fourth century. And this of course is the date at which the sheep was sheared that um, to produce the wool that was used in the, in the object, whatever that might have been, uh, rather of course than the time of its deposition. The, um, the plan of the, of the pits, um, because they are intercutting, because this, a lot of the stratigraphic relationships between them were destroyed during the 1870 excavation, it's been very, very difficult to work out what kind of building they may represent. The one thing we do know is that uh, that Western apsidal structure is, uh, is right. These are attempts at trying to make sense of the alignments of posts and the structures concerned. It's, it, it's not massively satisfactory we, be, simply because the evidence has been excavated away previously. Thank you, Tony. So one of the things that we can say from that is what we don't have is clear evidence for a big temple sitting up there on the highest point of Maryport with all of these pits. Certainly not the kind of temple building that we might imagine from the classical uh, uh, forms that we are so often uh, exposed to. But we did have uh, another bit of antiquarian evidence, RIB 832, this inscription, which clearly refers to something being built in the reign of Antoninus Pius. What was this? Well, we thought that this might come from a religious structure of the second century, rather more contemporary with those, the setting up of the altars. And this led us to think about other antiquarian evidence we had from 1880 in this case. And in that year, there were further diggings, uh, not so very far away from where the altars were discovered. And these revealed two rather fascinating structures, one circular, one rectangular. There were some debates as to what their function was. The circular one interpreted provisionally as perhaps a mausoleum, the rectangular one variously interpreted possibly as a temple, uh, possibly as some kind of public building of secular role. 
So um, in our final two field seasons, 20, uh, but starting actually in 2013, uh, we undertook to work in this area too. We had good reason to connect the story of this area with the area of the uh, altar pits, um, because one battered altar uh, matching those found in the uh, 1870s diggings had been found further south in our new uh, investigation area. Give you a little bit of a sense of what that looks like from the air. You can see excavations there underway in uh, 2014. Now, our work uh, led us to investigate the circular structure and the rectangular one. Here's the circular structure under investigation. Uh, some of the rather strange cuts through the site are based on our very careful uh, removal of the antiquarian fill from the diggings. We were able to observe a number of things that our antiquarian predecessors had not observed, including notably the fact the building had a formal porch structure. That's going to prove to be important. We were also able to understand much better the very complex uh, series of ditches that ran to the other side of the, the circular building, noting incidentally that it was cut off from uh, the fort in terms of direct access and that of course it faces away from the fort. Through a series of investigations we were able to conclude that actually this circular structure uh, stood uh, within a larger enclosure in the Hadrianic Antonine period, built in the Hadrianic or Antonine period. We then turned our attention to the rectangular structure to the south, uh, which uh, has become known as the rectangular temple, because in fact, that is what we can now demonstrate that it is. Here was an early investigation of the site. We took things rather deeper and were able to demonstrate uh, that the temple here uh, actually has two columns in antis, a very respectable classical form. Um, and that we can go further than that from some fine observations by my colleague here we've been able to make a lot out of the traces of the collapsed uh, rear wall of this structure sufficient observations and you can see that once upon a time it was in better uh, state to be able to deduce uh, its vital statistics we can work out how high it was we can also work out the angle of the roof Add to that the fact that we have a whole range of evidence for the color of stone used locally, and the fact that this was almost certainly uh, a slated roof, and you get a rather interesting and distinctive color combo for our site. But that was not all, because the temple was built over uh, a much earlier ditch, and in that ditch fill, dug into that ditch fill, where the blue arrow is, um, we saw this. This fascinating deposit, uh, which consists of sheep, goat bones and bird remains, is not a battered uh, discard from a barbecue, but is clearly the remains of a sacrificial offering. It had gone into one of the ditches that was originally around the circular uh, structure that we saw earlier um, and underlies the uh, temple. Now, the fact that this is actually uh, a deposit that we've radiocarbon dated through various means, uh, most likely into uh, the third century or so, late third or early fourth century, means the temple must be still later. And so we see this interesting development of the site, an expansion uh, of the site, uh, if you like, with another temple built on the same alignment, um, but adjacent. Two cult buildings then, probably looking something like this in the late third century. And you can see the fort there in the background. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about this is, as I said, the sites look away from the fort, which might seem a surprise, but they also look straight up towards the high ground, which happens to be where the altars are later thrown into pits. Why is this? Well, there are various arguments for why this might have been done. The Romans are not really known for making a lot of the summer solstice, uh, but it is interesting that the portals of these two temples would align quite well with when one might observe the summer solstice. Uh, could also be argued that this is due to some rather more uh, pragmatic considerations in terms of organisation of land in the settlement beyond the fort. What we can say, though, is we can learn a number of things about what was going on here. Uh, the worship uh, actually contains a number of uh, 
instances of practice known to us from religion elsewhere in the Roman uh, world. These two rather battered bits of clay pot uh, are from tatse or incense burners, uh, frequent uh, aspects of Roman rite. And we can see perhaps traces of the wealth of some of the devotees, or at least the wealth perhaps of some of the objects they left at the shrine here, a fine gold earring uh, here, uh, an intaglio already broken off its ring that has been deposited, and the star find here, actually this uh, remarkable back cut rock crystal uh, intaglio with the philosopher uh, Zeno. Really a very high end find, very few of these have been discovered, probably no more than four from the entire empire. So our view of the Maryport site is that the altars had nothing really to do with a pattern of ritual deposition. Uh, they are telling us something about late re Roman, uh, post-Roman or Roman reuse of an earlier sanctuary site. Um, but in the process, we've come to understand still better uh, some of the structures in the immediate vicinity and to pose new questions about what cult practice uh, looked like uh, on Rome's northwest frontier. So it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Thank you very much.